I never touched anyone inappropriately. Why was I even talking to this young woman? I was trying to help. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, Body Language Tactics, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes, did 20 years in the military, wrote the number one best selling book on behavior profiling, persuasion, and extreme influence. I teach interrogation and those other things to intelligence operatives and the general public. You can learn more at chasehughes.com. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance interrogation instructor, written 10 books on body language and behavior, and put together this body language tactics course with Scott. And I spend most of my time on Wall Street and corporate America. Awesome. Before you do anything else, I want to ask you all to subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. As soon as you hit the subscribe button, you become a panelist just like everybody else uh, that's a member. So, all right. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, Andrew Cuomo and the problems he's been having lately. And uh, Greg, you found the video. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, this was his official statement back last week, I think uh, 10 days or so ago, denying any allegations since been trumped a bit so you just have to look and see more details but this was about a 14 minute video we took out the pertinent pieces and brought them to you to watch him that's it yeah and as we go through this remember we're switzerland we don't care if he did it or he didn't do it we're just telling you what we see in his body language in these videos we don't know the backstory don't care about the backstory so keep that in mind as we go through this that's all we're showing you and telling you is what we see in his body language and we're all four of us sometimes we have a different view on it so there you have it. All right, ready? Here we go. First, I want you to know directly from me that I never touched anyone inappropriately or made inappropriate sexual advances. I am 63 years old. I have lived my entire adult life in public view. That is just not who I am. And that's not who I have ever been. Okay. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, already sounds prepared, because it is prepared. Uh, already feels like he's reading it from an auto cue because he is. I'm going to go into later on a little bit more about how his this statement's been, been written, because that's what kind of it turned out interested me most about this but let's start off with a little bit of uh, non-verbal around this uh, four very large as i counted it very large uh, eyebrow raises uh, probably of approval we'll see way more later on but even four seemed quite profound for me so instantly i go well, something up here um as, as as greg often calls them uh i think resume statements there or maybe that's yours chase i can't remember chase. who i heard it from first chase uh the idea of the resume statement great idea and i think we we get that here around the age around he always lived in the public eye and that's not who i am again those kind of resume statements kind of shout out to me and then the blink rate. I couldn't go into counting the blink rate, but I know a man who often will. So uh, so it seemed a lot to me. But uh, Chase, what did you think of the blink rate on that one? I did count the blink rate. Oh, I hope you did. Yes, we're gonna get to it. Okay. I was going to say I got it too. I was going to see if your ours is the same. I'll write mine down. All right. So, write yours down. Write the way down. to quickly calculate blink rate uh, for you is just like taking a pulse. You count how many blinks you see in 15 seconds and multiply that by four. And Scott and I may have had a different 15 second window, which would account for a little bit uh, different blink rate. Uh, but one thing that's fascinating to me right when this video first came up, and I watched these at like 5 a.m., is his lapel pin is three and a half inches lower than it is in any other video of him I could find on the entirety of the internet. 
And it's the seal of New York. So the seal of New York has gone from a place of high status, and I'm sounding like Mark here, yeah, nice. and it's coming down <laughs> like it's like a flag lowering itself uh, towards towards the end. And we're getting we're getting towards the evening of his career in this video. Uh, right away, there's severity softening, and severity softening occurs when a person does not want to say the name of a crime. So we hear the word sexual assault many times in these videos coming up, but you will not hear it in association with his behavior. Second, there's no legal definition of the word appropriate. And I think he knows this. He's an attorney. His dad was the governor of New York. He was married to a Kennedy. He was married to uh, Robert Kennedy's daughter. Uh, the blink rate I got here for this video, Scott, is 89. And his baseline in his other interviews that he's done is 21. Uh, also in this video, there are two non-contracted denials. This means a person did not use a contraction in their statement. Instead of saying, I didn't do that, they say, I did not do that. That was not me instead of it wasn't me. So two of those. There's a resume statement. I'm 63 years old. My entire life in public view. This is not who I am, who I've ever been. On the behavioral table of elements, which you can get for free, just Google that, his score is 20, which you need an 11 or higher to be the likelihood of uh, deception there. Scott, what do you got? All right. So I got 42 of them, but that's in the 23 seconds. Oops. That's in the 23 seconds. So that's 84. Um, so, but taking into account that the 27 seconds, that leaves uh, six seconds less. I think we about, we about hit it. So that would be, that would come out to about 89 mm -hmm. or right in there, roughly in there, give yeah. or take one or two. In the so I, yeah. Yeah. So good job, Chase. <laughs> 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 again, you, I said, again, I said, well, I got to count these Blake rates. Chase is going to, Amber goes, Chase is going to do it. And I said, yeah, I know. I know. I know he's going to do it. <laughs> anyway, um, so his eyebrows, his request for approval comes up when he's saying something positive about himself. And we don't, but later on, it changes a little bit as we go through there because it becomes a, oh, it becomes a comedy uh, as he goes through that. When he says never on the left side of his face, I, it's you could fight this either way and say it's duping delight or not. But to me, it looked like it was duping delight. I don't think he's thinking, oh, I'm getting away with this. But I think he's thinking, I better get away with this. And this isn't true. And I think I know it. And they don't. Um, his cadence is really slow, and it's so slow, it's like he's talking to somebody with something wrong with him, like they're just waking up from something. He's trying to tell them, you're going, you know, you're, you're, whatever the problem was, he's getting ready to tell them about it. Um, what else? That's pretty much it for what, I, for what I got. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so his tone is down the entire time. It's telling. And I agree with you, Mark. This is one of the most scripted things I've seen in a long time. Some words that come out. This is old politician talk. And, you know, this guy's old. He's in his 60s. I can say that because, you know, he's not much older than me, so I'll call him old. But he's talking like he has changed. The world's changed around him and he hasn't changed is what I'm hearing here. I always did this. His voice is telling. He illustrates. You can see his hands in that moving. But he also uses his brow a bit to illustrate what he's thinking. And then he says, I want you to hear this directly from me, as if that matters, as if that matters. To him, it does, because now I'm the governor of New York. And I think you're right, Chase. I looked at the same thing with the lapel pin is further down. There's an interesting thing that he says, I never touched anyone inappropriately. And look at the side of his face draw down. Now, it wouldn't matter, except for in the next sentence, he says inappropriate, and it doesn't do that. When you're pronouncing a word that's almost identical, you expect the mouth to move kind of the same way. When he says inappropriately the first time, he's got kind of a sideways smirk down on the left side. And that's what you're seeing, Scott. That's the reason we're saying, look, something is up here. The other thing is, if we think about Bill Clinton conditioning the question, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. It's powerful to use a person's words. We run with Peter Hyatt on with Eric Hunley. Watch Eric Hunley's show at Unstructured. Yeah. And we run with Peter Hyatt. And he said he thinks that polygraphs are very successful when the person frames the question with the other person's words. And this is a way a politician doctors words and dances around them. This is an old school politician who's been doing it his whole life. He makes a point of it. And Chase, you point out he's married into royalty. So he is he is a politician his whole life, whether he's been running for office or not. He's been in the camera that in the asymmetric face is just telling for all of us. And we're looking at it very carefully. 
I think we're seeing a guy who is trying to make sure he gets to this point up front and establishes his credentials so that he can now tell you what he did and he did and he did and not talk about what he didn't so much as what he did and did and did. And we're going to hear a lot of it. In terms of blink rate, I'll give you my number, way too high. That's my my number. <laughs> I see his eyes are just blah, 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 blah. And then you look at him and you're thinking, you can't get any, oh, wait, just wait. His blink rate gets so high, I thought he was going to take off. And if you watch, he does a lip compression because he's got all that, the way his face is shaped, he's very demonstrative with his face. His lip compressions are not as clear as they are on a person who has a lot less wrinkling around their face. And he lip compresses, which means he's hiding something. Doesn't mean he's lying. It means he's hiding feelings or more information right after he says inappropriately. And you see it. It's just not as pronounced as it would be in me or Chase or Scott or Mark. So look for baseline for the guy. We're looking for deviation. And I think we're seeing it. That's all I got. So keep Excellent. in mind, uh, when we are talking about blink rate, a high blink rate is typically tied with high stress. Low blink rate is typically tied with high focus. Not always relaxed focus. Sometimes it's uh, focusing on a potential threat. So that's what we mean when we say blink rate. Yep. And, and what we know is blink rate is often caused by fight or flight and your lids dry out and your lids have two purposes, protect the eye and wet the eye. And as your lids dry out, they dry the eye. And so they move faster and faster and faster and faster. So that's it. First, I want you to know directly from me that I never touched anyone inappropriately or made inappropriate sexual advances. I am 63 years old. I have lived my entire adult life in public view. That is just not who I am. And that's not who I have ever been. There is one complaint that has been made that bothered me most. That was a complaint made by a young woman, Charlotte Bennett, who worked in my office. And it's important to me that you fully understand the situation. Charlotte worked in my office last year as an assistant. She was smart, talented, and eager to learn. She identified herself to me as a survivor of sexual assault. She said that she came to work in my administration because of all the progress we had made in fighting sexual assault. She talked about the personal trauma that she endured and how she was handling it. I could see how it had affected her. I could see her pain. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, when he, he watch, you can't see his hands, but you can see his shoulders moving. You can watch him shift to his right hand when he starts talking about the complaint. When he was over here earlier talking about positive things, I watched him a few weeks ago. Go back and find a video of him talking when he talked about positive things he used one hand, negative things another. Just an interesting thing. And Chase, I know you'll talk about hemispheric tendencies and that, but. It's an important note that something has changed. That's it. He does what I call holy ground here. Bill Clinton did it. Now, listen to me. I got work to do for the American people. And he's doing a little bit of that here. He's talking about this came from something that happened in my past. You'll hear him start to go there. Uh, this is 53 seconds of a little bit of resume statement in there. He talks a little bit about her. He says that she was smart and talented. He's reading that. When he says progress, and I'm not going to go a whole lot here except for two things left. When he says progress, he does kind of a condemning little brow thing down. Something's going on in his head around progress. He doesn't do it any other time in this video. Just watch that little down when he talks about progress. I think he can foresee the future a few days and think all oh, my progress is for naught. Maybe that's it. I can't tell you what he's thinking, but I see some reason caused that. All this work I put into and never mind whether he did this or not, not important to the conversation. Just pay attention. And then he uses, I love politicians because they develop wonderful, Mark, you probably help them with this sometimes, maybe not this guy, they develop wonderful tools, endured. You know, he probably says endure longer because of a New York vowel, but this is extremely long and it allows him time to catch up with the next word on the teleprompter. It's really cool to watch guys who are talented at this versus a guy who is brand new and just starting off and dancing all over the place, trying to get away from things. He's right now, he's calm, but he also has one last thing and that's when he, um, says that he shows some irritation when he says situation watch his eyes watch the drill yeah that's all i got um chase what do you got yep so if uh greg you invented the worm on a griddle here he's it's kind starting. of starting 
he's kind of a, a getting there. He's warming up yep. for sure. And when you, when Greg is talking about this gestural tendency, we tend to gesture positive things on one side. We'll look one direction. We'll we'll gesture one direction, generally speaking, uh, for positive and negative things. And this is interesting because it's sometimes tied to timelines all of us see timelines most of us from left being past for me my past is that way and because we read left to right and the future would be this way on a timeline he's different than most people and most politicians that he gestures towards his timeline past for positive things and i think that's telling especially of his current state of psychology that the uh the bad stuff is out here in the future or with using his right hand. And that's how we all view timelines that way. A, a quick tip for you, if you're ever trying to persuade someone and you want them to think of the future, it's easy for us to think like that's the future because that's my timeline. But you need to gesture with the opposite hand to make someone start thinking that direction on their internal timeline. So to, towards your past or with your left hand while you're doing that. So this the lip licking that we're seeing here over and over is his baseline. We can see it in other interviews that he's done. There's a shoulder shrug in here, but it's a little bit muted. And I think it might be tied to a, a hand gesture. Not, we cannot be sure. Uh, saying Charlotte's name uh, moved his eyes off of the cue card and uh, toward, I, I would, might say, internal dialogue, which is at our five o'clock we're kind of thinking to ourselves or, or processing some emotion. But speaking of emotion, there isn't any in this video, literally zero, as he's talking about this emotional encounter uh, about her pain and how it affected her. There is no emotion whatsoever. Uh, it's just a cue card. And when he says she identified herself to me, this is tied into him asking people about this stuff. Her identifying herself to him does not exclude his deliberate asking about it. So I'll, I'll leave that there as, as kind of a trial consulting note. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so you're, you're right. The words are kind of there in terms of the, the emotion or the sentiment, probably, on the cue cards. And I'll come to a moment in a moment who's responsible for those cue cards, because that interested me, because there's some clear PR going on here, some clear spin going on there. That's part of my background. I still do some of that for some people. And so when I see this going on, I'm kind of interested because there's a there's a strategy going on here. And I know the strategy being used. Uh, there's there's uh, kind of a redirect and ref refute going on. So there's a whole bunch of accusations. And so what the spin has done here is to go, well, let's let's concentrate on just one of those. And if we can refute just the one, then there's a piece of kind of bad logic that happens. But maybe the public will go for it because, look, you know, the public are not so bright, not so bright as us politicians and, and spin doctors. If we can refute just one of the cases, the public will put their suitcase up, go home, and they'll bother about something else. So that, that I believe, is the strategy going on here, although they, and, and that strategy can work, quite honestly, uh, but it doesn't quite play out, and we'll see how it doesn't quite play out. Uh, let's have a look at, at what's happening around him. He, he's chosen, or certainly his strategist, has chosen to do this in the office with all the seals of office around him. So he's already uh, doing it with the imagery of power, those two flags. And, and just as was said there, the, the, the pin, which, uh, yes, I now notice, now you bring it to my attention, is, is, is too low. It should be up where the buttonhole is. It should be using, the, the pin should be going through the buttonhole or just above it, uh, because that would be the right place, place for it. So, you know, I wasn't able to to, to baseline him, which is always a, a bad thing to be to be honest. So I didn't notice that it was lower than usual. And now it's been brought to my attention. That suggests to me that 
somebody isn't paying attention. Somebody, the handlers here, have their attention taken elsewhere. The handlers are under pressure at this point, because a good handler would literally go up to the politician and sort them out and make sure everything is perfect. So maybe the handlers are under pressure here. What's the general feeling of this statement? Well, he's already gone into this empathy piece. He's decided to pick on one case, okay, refute that and show a lot of empathy for that. And if he does that really well, then we can all wrap up and go home. Let's see how well that plays out for him. I did a little bit of investigation because <laughs> I'll just kind of break the mood a bit. It, it doesn't go very well for him. Whoever's looking after him right now isn't going to do as good a job as they hope of writing this speech for him. So I had a look into it. It's his brother. His brother, Chris Cuomo, is his spin doctor right now. Uh, CNN broadcaster, as I understand it, uh, journalist, uh, anchor, maybe perhaps you'll know better than I do what his pedigree is. Anyway, sorry, Chris, you don't do such a good job, my friend. It's, uh, it's, it's going to go a bit sideways for you. But having said that, I just want to say they, he uses the same tactic here as was used today on the 10th of August in his uh, resignation apology. Same thing. Pick one event, focus on that, try and refute that so we all pack up and go home. It didn't work well for him today either. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. In this one, Chase, his blink rate is 73 times in 53 seconds. That was my count. I don't know what you got on that. Um, and that denotes he's going through a little bit of stress, as we know he is, and it's obvious. That you don't need to say it. That's what's happening. When he says there's one complaint, we see a nostril flare. We see a lot of nostril flares throughout this, but this is one, I, in my opinion, is of, of anger, just sort of a micro expression of anger on that one. Um, and then when he says uh, that has been made, uh, um, there's a complaint that has been made that bothered me the most. We see the, the contempt micro expression seven times. Now, a lot of times the one side of his face goes up and he just cranks that thing out. But you can see this one going up at the same time, this side of the face. But in this case, we don't see that. We only see the one side going up the whole time. So he has a real problem with that. And then when he says complaint, that's where we see that short little shoulder shrug. And that's suggesting this is nothing. You know, it's like, yeah. Like, like it's not a big deal. He's trying to blow it off. But at the same time, it shows he's not that sure. It would indicate that he's not that sure of, of that part of it anyway. Um, and when he says Charlotte Bennett, when he says her name, we see a micro expression of contempt there as well. This is I'm going to focus a lot on micro expressions because there's not a whole lot of big stuff going on. Um, and I agree, Chase, that the tongue jutting. It's not even jutting here. It's just it's just grooming and preparation to speak, and that's part of his baseline. Um, and then when he says um, she was smart, his eyes closed for a little too long. They closed for about a third of a second. The normal blink lasts about, it's like one three hundredth of a second. It's really, really quick, as everyone knows. Um, and that, that, that's almost like a, a wincing. He doesn't want to say her name, so, which makes sense at this point as well. Then he gives, when he says, uh, on the progress we had made, we see, that, we see a little a micro expression of anger and, and a side eye on that. Which says this this is eating him up. He hates saying this because this is what's what's getting him in trouble, and uh, and he hates it. He doesn't like it. And then when he says she endured, we, we see a small micro expression of anger. It's really teeny, but if you look at it really close and go through it, you'll see it's there. Um, I think he's mad at this girl or this woman, which he should be, if he's if he's in that position, thinks he's getting away with it. Of course, he's going to be mad at her. So I don't know if he, I shouldn't say he should be. I would say he is. So that's what I got. We good? Yeah. All right. There is one complaint that has been made that bothered me most. That was a complaint made by a young woman, Charlotte Bennett, who worked in my office. And it's important to me that you fully understand the situation. Charlotte worked in my office last year as an assistant. She was smart, talented, and eager to learn. She identified herself to me as a survivor of sexual assault. She said that she came to work in my administration because of all the progress we had made in fighting sexual assault. She talked about the personal trauma that she endured and how she was handling it. I could see how it had affected her. 
I could see her pain. People now ask me, why was I even talking to this young woman if I knew she was dealing with such issues? Why did I even engage with her? That is the obvious and fair question, and one I have thought a lot about. The truth is that her story resonated deeply with me. I had heard the same story before, with the same ugliness, the same injustice, the same damage. Not only had I heard the story before, I had lived with the story before. My own family member is a survivor of sexual assault in high school. I have watched her live and suffer with the trauma. I would do anything to make it go away for her. But it never really goes away. I spent countless days and nights working through these issues with her and therapists and counselors. I'm governor of the state of New York, but I felt powerless to help and felt that I had failed her. I couldn't take the pain away. I still can't. And this young woman brought it all back. All right, Chase, what do you got? Oh, sorry. Okay. Chase, what do you got? If you sum up this entire thing, the overall message is, why did I engage with her? Because she brought a bunch of pain back. That's actually what's being said. There's a single shrug when he, when he says the words, I'm governor. And the single shoulder shrug uh, is indicative of someone lacking confidence in, in what they're saying. And I want you just to pay attention to how he phrases himself as he's powerless, is how he felt. Not angry, not compassionate, not saddened, not paternal, not protective. Power. It was about power. And just, just to talk about these victims for one second, in the presence of power, where there's a power differential, uh, our reaction to authority takes hold. And we react very strongly to authority because it helped our ancestors survive, be, being part of a little tribe back in the day. Uh, so if this happened to anybody, especially when there's this power differential, there should be no embarrassment or guilt. None of that should be necessary because we have things like white coat syndrome now where we respond obediently to doctors. We have the Milgram experiment where just with a, an authority figure present, people get talked into committing murder in less than an hour. Uh, so something like this is not a big deal. The accuser stories, if you go and take a look at them, are, are credible, according to me, verbally and non-verbally. And they all reflect the, the sentiment of somebody who'd been involved with a narcissist. And narcissists don't have a lot of sensitivity. And that's what I think is going on here. So when they try to fake uh, sensitivity, it seems normal and rational to them but people around them might feel creepy and awkward because of it, because it's not uh, real. So, and I think when there's a, a narcissist in power, uh, of course, um, this is hypothetical, there's an increasing deviance in the use of that power. And we see this markedly in, in many different examples and, and deviance in antisocial ways to exploit it and to use it. And there is a continuous need for reassurance of their status and hierarchy. And if you want to go look into this a little bit more, this is a 2020 research project called Malignant Narcissism and Power uh, by Charles, I can't remember the last name, and Peter Devlin. And Joe Navarro has a wonderful article on this, and we can drop a link in the description of the video just below this. Sorry for running a little bit long here. Uh, Scott, what do you got? He didn't run long. <laughs> what about it all? Good stuff. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. We see that the tongue coming out there at the top again. That's he's in preparation for speaking in this gr little grooming thing there. We see the frown and squint on people now. Ask me when he hears that. We squint when we see something coming that's going to hurt us, or we we start hearing information we we don't want to hear. We start are given information we don't want to hear. We'll squint a little bit. So he's saying something. 
he doesn't want to say, and that information he knows is not good for him. Then we see a little tongue jut, and this is what um, uh, Desmond Morris referred to when he was talking about the, the ejection or rejection of things as you go through. That's what we're seeing here because he doesn't want to say this at all, and he doesn't like hearing it, and he doesn't like hearing himself say it. Uh, then we see that, that fast and lasting head shake. Um, why, why, why was I even talking with this woman? Why was I even talking with this woman? I'll bet you whoever the important woman is and his wife was like, what are you even talking to her for? What are you gonna, you, why, why is that going on? I bet his attorney was going, dude, what are you doing? Why are you ta-? But they were all doing that to him. And so he's almost mimicking that because he's used to seeing it. They're probably doing it over there behind, behind the camera going, oh, as he's saying that. Uh, let's see. He's got the head swipe when he, on the word question. And when you see things like that, they're, in other words, they're sort of swiping that away. And when he says question, he does that. It's not that heavy, but you'll see it. You'll see what I'm talking about when you rewatch this. Because that's the root. That question is the root of his whole problem. Why do you even engage with this girl? When he says question, again, watch for that swipe away. Then he gets into that, I'm the governor of the state of New York. Boy, everything changes right then. That head goes back, gets that tilted, narcissistic look on his face and that tone. Things slow down a little bit more, and he gets a little bit, he gets all, you know, I just hate those kind of, that, that kind of thing. Anyway, he's, his pronoun changes from I to I'm. Everything changes in the, uh, right in here. And, I can, and when this happens, you see somebody that's talking to you like something's wrong with you, and they're saying every word just like this. Then you see um, the, the ego switch is what I call it. The ego switch gets flipped, and he goes, I'm the governor of New York. And he starts that business. Man, so watch for the ego switch. You'll see when someone's just trotting right along, saying what they're saying, and then things change. That head will go back a little bit, and they'll start feeding you whatever it is. They're, they're up to feeding you there. Um, yeah, and at, at this point, and up to that point, his diction has been perfect, been really, really good, but it gets even smoother through there. Now, at no point is he loping in here, and of course, we talk about loping is when someone's talking, and they're just giving their story, loping a lot right along. He's not at all. This is going phrase by phrase by phrase, and it's been, like Mark was saying, it's been written out perfectly. And a little while, I'll talk about how a thing that attorneys use um, when you train someone to to speak in court uh, how this is set up. I know what it is because I've, I've dealt with this situ- that situation before, but not in, in with somebody who was bad, a different situation. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, not a lot. You guys have covered almost everything I have. A couple of things I would point out. We say this guy's baseline is grooming his mouth to talk, making his lips look more attractive. Look for when it deviates, and you you hit it dead on, Scott. There's, there's, a, Nor- there's a Desmond Morris quick jut to push out something distasteful, Look, go back and look at this video and find the one because he's doing many, 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 as Chase, as you would say, appearance grooming kind of things. But this one is a jut. This is a push. Desmond Morris said it's the first thing babies learn to do to push food out of their mouth. And it is when something's distasteful. That people ask me, this, the squint, yeah, certainly he sees bad things coming. And he starts to talk a little more forward in his mouth. He's starting to sound a little bit more like, uh-oh, I, I've got to be careful what I'm doing here. Here's the interesting piece. One minute, 28 seconds, me, me, me is all I hear. I don't hear anything other than me, 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 wrapping myself in a blanket of compassion, telling you how I've looked out for a person in my family who's been through this. And that's all important for the next setup, because why would I talk to this young woman who had been sexually assaulted about her sex life? Well, because I got experience with somebody in the past, and I know. Now, it's well scripted and well and well structured, but it comes back to haunt him coming up. Just wait, you'll see it. That's all I got. Right. Mark? So, oh, Mark, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry, Mark, what are you Good. Uh, empathy narrative happening there. Uh, I agree with the narcissistic tone there because uh, his brother has written that passage there, I'm governor of the state of New York. He's written it, at, meant, it's meant to be powerless irony. It's meant to go, look, I'm governor of the, I'm even governor of the state of New York and I can't do anything uh, with family members who've, who've, uh, who are survivors of, of this kind of abuse. What uh, Andrew Cuomo does is to use it as a power play. 
not as how it's meant to be written there as being powerless. He actually puts inflection on it that makes it powerful. So he can't even help himself when something's been written for him to take his status down. He uses it as an opportunity to bring his statement, his status up. He uses something which is meant to be de demotive into another resume statement. It's quite extraordinary. And I'm sure his brother doing the best that he can, uh, he's not brilliant at the job, was pretty annoyed at how his brother delivers on this. But unfortunately, what this is, is kind of 101 stock uh, risk management here, in that they go for the strategy of show empathy, and roll out the family. Now, if, if the, you know, this is where in, in, in a classic situation, you're outside their house and the politician comes forward and the wife and kids come out to the gate and the press are around and, and the wife shows that she still loves the husband and the kids are adorable. And we show this beautiful family unit and then in they go again and we hope the press go away with those photos. He's kind of doing the same verbally going, look you know I've got empathy here it's a family situation have a look at I mean I guess it's a it's a sister or a wife or even a, a, a child I don't know who it is but ultimately look if you had any real empathy and you really wanted to use the power to make that go away you just wouldn't mention it you wouldn't bring it up in front of everybody if, if it's something that somebody wants to kind of deal with and maybe even, you know, push to one side or forget about or deal with in their own time, don't bring it out to the whole public. You're doing the exact opposite. So again, he's using his power here in a, in a, um, a rather corrupted manner, I, I, I would suggest. There, that's what I got on that one. Mark, no longer on the Cuomo's Christmas card list. <laughs> yes, yes. He, his Christmas cards were rubbish anyway. They were all about him. People now ask me, why was I even talking to this young woman if I knew she was dealing with such issues? Why did I even engage with her? That is the obvious and fair question, and one I have thought a lot about. The truth is that her story resonated deeply with me. I had heard the same story before, with the same ugliness, the same injustice, the same damage. Not only had I heard the story before, I had lived with the story before. My own family member is a survivor of sexual assault in high school. I have watched her live and suffer with the trauma. I would do anything to make it go away for her. But it never really goes away. I spent countless days and nights working through these issues with her and therapists and counselors. I'm governor of the state of New York, but I felt powerless to help and felt that I had failed her. I couldn't take the pain away. I still can't. And this young woman brought it all back. <laughs> she is about the same age. I thought I had learned a lot about the issue from my family's experience. I thought I could help her work through a difficult time. I did ask her questions I don't normally ask people. I did ask her how she was doing and how she was feeling. And I did ask questions to try to see if she had positive support of dating relationships. I know too well the manifestations of sexual assault trauma and the damage that it can do in the aftermath. I was trying to make sure she was working her way through it the best she could. Hi, uh, Greg, what do you got? So I'm going to leave you guys a ton of stuff. I'm only going to touch one thing, and that is a cadence shift, distancing in the sentence, everything about his word patterns and all that change around one thing. He says, I asked, I questioned her. I did, I did ask her. Then he says, and I did ask questions to see if she had positive, supportive dating relationships. What the hell does that mean to anybody here? 
Number one. Number two, listen to the cadence shift to see, hesitate. Everything in that sentence is the crux of the matter. If I saw nothing else here, I would say, okay, that's enough for me to want to dig and investigate. Everything changes. He's still doing his usual thing. This is probably his style when he was dating when he was young, but not to people in your organization do you talk to that. I mean, Chase, we're both military folks. That's death in the military. To do any of that kind of conversation with a subordinate is insane, much less to be at this level and talking to somebody about that kind of thing. But listen to that cadence shift, that distancing from the question, the conditioning of what he's saying, the word pattern shifts, and his tone change. Great indicators. This is what I live for is a baseline shift. That's it. Scott, what do you got? All right. Uh, again, the tongue the tongue situation, I'm going to call it tongue jut. He's just grooming. That's preparation to speak. And then we see a bunch of short shrugs all the way through the first half of this thing, a ton of them. That, that denotes, it suggests he's unsure about what he's saying because he knows this isn't true. Um, and his reading skills slip here when he says, uh, I did ask her questions I don't normally ask people. He should have said, I did ask her questions I don't normally ask people. But he's reading, and he's probably done this three or four times after reading it five or ten times before he went to bed the night before and that morning as well. So the emphasis should have been on and. Uh, it should have been on ask, not on people. So that's odd. It just sounds odd. When you listen to this back, check that out. Um, and then he starts making himself smaller there toward the end. When he gets start, And you'll see people, we call it turtling when their head starts going down. But we see his shoulders start getting small, and he actually goes, he gets smaller as he goes along. That indicates that well, you'll see this when people are getting ready to rob, rob a place or they're getting ready to shoplift. You'll see them getting real small because they're trying to make themselves unseeable or, or, or less easy to see by others in there. So that's what you'll see them doing. That's how you can spot shoplifters at a distance. You can see them. They're the ones that get the smallest, and they'll start walking around almost hunchbacked when they're walking around in there. Greg, you nailed a bunch of it. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, so oh, remember what Chase was saying right early on about blink rate and high blink rate can be, you know, a sign of stress. That's why we look at it. And low blink rate can be, but not always, a sign of focus. So we see here that his blink rate has gone down. I, I didn't I didn't count it. That's not my jam. But uh, <laughs> it's it, like Greg. I'm like, and that's a lot lower than it was before. Now, what, what we could easily end up doing is going, oh, well, he's under less stress here then. Maybe, maybe this is factual. Maybe this is true. No, I think Chase is right about this, that this is about focus. He's focusing even more on these words because, as everybody said, there's some mighty sentences there that are a little bit too long, a little bit too extreme. There's some word gymnastics uh, going on, but uh, but he's no Simone Biles to execute any of that, is he? So so it's a it's a tricky maneuver he's trying to do right now, and I think that's why his blink rate has gone down. Not because he's suddenly being super accurate with 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 the facts here. I think it's because he's trying to be super accurate with what's been written, and what's been written is actually really hard to execute for him. Well, what is he trying to execute? Here? here. Um, I think it's the idea of I made a mistake because I was trying to be the friend, uh, the, the counselor, the therapist, the coach, the family member. It's one of those kind of Prince Andrew ideas of I was just being, you know, too noble. Chase, what do you got? So we're back to that baseline really low blink rate except for two different scenarios when he's talking about her dating life and the damage that uh, sexual assault can do and his shoulders strangely seem to punctuate each paragraph that is he's reading off of the screen and the screen this reading off of a, word, a teleprompter is not his friend here it's it's taking away from every ounce of genuineness. It would, have, it would have probably been a much better idea to just go off bullet points on a teleprompter instead of exact sentences. His eyes move again off teleprompter and around to five o'clock at the mention of sexual assault trauma. So basically what we're seeing here is half truths with half lies piled on top of it to cover up something that happened. 
And if the feeling, pay attention to this. If the feeling we just talked about in the last video was him feeling powerless when he couldn't help, the feeling he was aiming towards here would be power. And as a quick side note, uh, he said he was trying to help with all of his experience. Uh, he just mentioned in the last video there was nothing he could do, and he didn't do anything. And as a quick uh, asterisk on this, they have therapists for this stuff. And those therapists probably have business cards that you can give out. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. She's about the same age. I thought I had learned a lot about the issue from my family's experience. I thought I could help her work through a difficult time. I did ask her questions I don't normally ask people. I did ask her how she was doing and how she was feeling. And I did ask questions to try to see if she had positive support of dating relationships. I know too well the manifestations of sexual assault trauma and the damage that it can do in the aftermath. I was trying to make sure she was working her way through it the best she could. Right. I thought I had learned enough and had enough personal experience to help her. But I was wrong. I have heard Charlotte and her lawyer, and I understand what they are saying. But they read into comments that I made and draw inferences that I never meant. They ascribe motives I never had. And simply put, they heard things that I just didn't say. All right, Chase, what do you got? Uh, he says he thought he had learned enough. I'm not sure about what. Uh, some kind of therapy. Uh, I, I couldn't get that. Because uh, he said he could. there was nothing he could do to help his relative. So I'm not sure what he would have learned uh, in that situation. Uh, but he's using his hands uh, in an unusual baton gesture when he says the words help her. You can see it bounce uh, when he says those two words. He wants, he wants you to pay attention to those. Uh, they heard things different than they claim to have heard things. Uh, he's an attorney. He knows this very well. And they heard things is different than they claim to have heard things. So he's saying that they actually heard them, not that they're making a claim to do that. And the moment that he mentioned Charlotte, his eyes moved back to five o'clock again off of the teleprompter. And now we have a pretty good data point and we can see where this goes from here. Maybe we might see this again. And as a baseline point, this head shaking, I want you to please pay attention to this as you're watching these next few clips. This is most common in his denial of things. He, when he denies something, he shakes his head. He uses this almost exclusively for disagreement with a statement or when making strong denials, which we actually don't see very much of here at all. So head shaking, disagreement, and denial is his baseline 99% of all the times I've ever seen it. I don't think I've ever seen an opposite uh, of that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, a couple of things for me here. If you watch him, I think this guy can't read body language of people he's talking to. We'll see pictures of that in a couple of minutes. But I think he probably thought, I'll make this up, whatever I do is okay. Whatever I do is okay. No no feedback loop. If if I do things and you, I can't see that you're rejecting it, then it must be okay. Some people are blind to that and dumb to that. I, I just will leave it at that. But when I see him, when he says, they saw things I didn't do, they heard things I didn't say. No, they probably heard exactly what you said. You didn't get the feedback loop to pay attention to what they're doing. I'm starting to see a pattern of that, and I'm just going to leave it there. But I do see a lot of that brow up. He's got one brow up. He's starting to look like he's got some contempt for whatever is going on, whatever's here. And this is all written. So, guys, this is a well-rehearsed politician who's been doing this his entire life. He knows how to talk to a camera. He knows how to pay attention. And Chase, to your point, very New York thing to do, right? No, 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 not happening, not happening, not happening. He's got that rehearsed, but that brow is giving him away that he's got contempt for the whole thing. And I just don't think he has a feedback loop, my opinion from here. We'll see it in a couple of minutes. Uh, Mark, what do you got? 
Yeah, so he doesn't quite know when to when to show the emotions or play the emotions and when not, because at this point in the statement, this is a statement of opinion. Like they saw it like this, but I saw it like this. That's just opinion. That's kind of factual from from his point of view. It doesn't need any emotion. Now, before in the other parts of the statement, it needed emotion and he didn't have it. Here, he's now indicating and laying on with the tone of his voice an emotion which isn't needed at all. Now, that's either, you know, he's, he's in his own world doing his own thing. He's been told to, can you be emotional? And now he's like turned it on. Or maybe this is the bit that he really wants you to pay attention to. And, and that's a strong possibility simply because this is the crux of the logic of the argument for him or, or for his writers here, for his PR, for his, for his spin, is that if we negate this specific situation, then we negate all situations here. And that's not a bad strategy. And it, and it could totally work for him if he didn't then go on to talk about a bunch of other situations and try and negate those as well. This would be the point in this classic piece of PR that you'd just go, okay, I'm done, pack up, let's go. And let's get, and what you do right now is that let's get back to the job, which he does a lot later. The the Because this whole idea of show empathy, find a specific, negate that, so negate all, then let's get back to the job is is a is a classic of of the old school of pr which is really what's happening here it is pretty you know truck old school stuff um so so yeah so vocal tone seems uh particularly wrong in this situation and it indicates to me this is the crux of the argument this is the piece of writing i really want you to pay attention to uh scott what do you got on this one I agree with you completely, Mark. Not only does his tone change, it goes up a little bit. The tone of the speech itself changes from this supposedly, oh, I want to help you thing to accusatory. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's, he's totally changed it in there. And everything changes in here, not just, not just that. At the end, he said, I just didn't say that. Again, it's small, but it's a deviation from baseline. He's contracting now. When he's been talking to you, you're like, there's something wrong with you. You just woke up from you know, being sedated from something to uh, he's just talking, trying to talk normal and sound normal at that point. When he says, but they read into comments I, that I, uh, that I made and they draw inferences, inferences that I never meant. That's, that's just, I agree. Oh, everybody's nailed this. It's, it's classic. Just, I can't say it's a, it's a cuss word, but his blink rate increases here. It's at, uh, 42 blinks in 33 seconds. So that's uh, 84. Again, we're back to 84 and uh, right in there. That's a lot. And I think that's the most we've gotten so far. I believe that's right, right, right in there. Uh, and this, again, this cadence isn't loping. He's just trying to make it through at this point. He's trying to make his spots in there. And I'm sure at this point, mentally, he's getting a little bit bored with this. So that's why it's in these weird, odd sounding chunks. And it sounds odd because he's trying to make it sound natural, like it's coming from the heart. But when there's no heart there, there's no emotion in it, it sounds like there's no emotion in it. And that's what we're, we're hearing here. Did everybody hear that little thing going? Wee? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. What, what was that? I don't know. Mark, I was Chase, you guys was. didn't hear it? No. Oh, okay. I heard it. I don't know what the, yeah, I don't know what that we, was. I was like, what? Yeah, it was weird. All right, here we go. I thought I had learned enough and had enough personal experience to help her. But I was wrong. I have heard Charlotte and her lawyer, and I understand what they are saying. But they read into comments that I made and draw inferences that I never meant. They ascribe motives I never had. And simply put, they heard things that I just didn't say. Charlotte, I want you to know that I am truly and deeply sorry. I brought my personal experience into the workplace, and I shouldn't have done that. I was trying to help. Obviously, I didn't. I am even more sorry that I further complicated the situation. My goal was the exact opposite. I wish nothing but good for you 
and for all survivors of sexual assault. Or you and other robots like you. <laughs> Good Lord. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to be quick on this. And there's 10 seconds of I'm sorry, but I don't see sorrow at all in this. He does a lip compression. We always talk about where he's containing something. And he does a deep swallow. He would do that, too, if he were truly sorry, because you're trying to contain emotion in that. But typically, when somebody's sorry, those brows rise in the center. You can't miss it. There's emotion involved. Mark, I'm with you. If this is emotion, this is he needs a coach. By the way, um, if you really need a coach, look behind all of us. We've all got books and stuff you could read and figure out what sorry looks like, at least. we got body language tactics. Chase has courses. Mark's got courses. Guys, if you got to go in front of a camera and you don't know what sorry looks like, just don't go. Just don't go. It's easier. Just I'll leave it at that and say, uh, Chase, what do you got? And if you've got a lot on the line, just reach out to us and book books him one on one. Uh, when he says sorry, not that, not that we support scummy th behavior. Just let's make that. Oh clear. yeah, sorry. one of those guys. We don't. Yeah. 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 Good luck. No, not in. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, when he says sorry here, the eyes move to like a five, maybe at like a four o'clock uh, position again off teleprompter. Interesting to note where we're seeing these deviations. Uh, his head shaking is a little scary to me uh, since it only occurs in denial when he's denying and disagreeing heavily with something when he says, I wish her the best, I want the best for her, and I want her to be, I'm not sure exactly what he says. But the overall message here is, sorry for trying to help, good luck, and and I think there's some contempt on the left side of his face, just like Scott, you saw a little bit earlier, uh, right there, you could see that contempt over there. Now, I want you to just to pay attention, you'll see him use the right side of his face a whole lot. But if you look at the lines that are on his face, this one's a lot more pronounced, which means that he's probably been doing that for years. There's a lot of different names for that. I tend to use the, the name expression etching. So this facial expression. Expretching. It's expretching. Oh, well, I'm going to trademark that right now. <laughs> get the order, get the URL. <laughs> and uh, that's all I got. Mark, what have you? Uh, yeah, here's what I have. Uh, I have the use of the first name only, um, which is there to imply, I think, intimacy with that person and therefore friendliness and therefore you know, come on, can't we all just be friends? You know, I think you're over this. It's to it's to try and convince us, the audience, that that this isn't as severe. And there is an emotive tone in that in that name um, that I think we've all heard before uh, with 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 O oh, Suzanne. And you, you'll know you'll know which particular video that that comes up in. It has such a similarity of that and she's just, just trying to it's almost sung it's almost the name is almost sung in a way that creates that sense of of, of belonging and intimacy um the last part of this is i wish nothing but good for you and all survivors of sexual assault and all survivors of sexual assault well we presume that's true anyway don't we we presume like i don't even, i don't know why you need to say that unless you want it on your resume. Uh, you know, Andrew Cuomo wished nothing but good things and a good life to anybody who was a, a survivor of sexual assault. We presume that for anybody who's, who's decent. We presume that. So that doesn't need to be said. So why is that written in? Like, uh, Chris, why'd you write that in? Don't write that in. That's not needed. You didn't need to write that. That's a proof that we know that. We think that's going to be true. The moment you write that, we think, oh, you even had to write that in. You even had to write that in. That's a bit of a problem. Well, this is going badly wrong. This is not good. It's going badly wrong. Uh, who we got left? Scott, what do you got? Yeah. There's, a, there's so much that's changed in the tone of his voice. So much has changed from volume to the, to the not just in the volume part, but the tone of his voice. And, and what I mean by this, you hear him talking with this gravelly thing a lot of times. That's almost dis disappeared in this point. 
his volume in this one compared to even the, the video before this one, video five, has gone down about a half a dB. Doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it's a lot when you're in a situation like this because it's a huge deviation in his baseline at this point. He's been he's been in a strong volume the whole time, but now it's come down some. And the way he's delivering has changed as well. His tone on these words, I hate to say it this way because it sounds weird, but it's rounder. It's there. It's, it's smoother. The tone is, is much more smooth than it has been up to this, this point. The, the gravelly thing is just about completely gone. And we can see his eyes tracking the monitor, the teleprompter as he's going through. We can see him at this point tracking him because I think he's bored out of his skull while at the same time trying to do this fake emoting of his feelings. Um, and you're right when he says, well, I'm even sorry, that's when we see that micro expression. And I think I, I fought with that, whether it was contempt or disgust. So I'm going to, I'm going to lean over on, on disgust for that. Um, cause I, I kept watching that over and over and you're right, Chase, that one side keeps going up. He's got that other one too, but this time the other one didn't get, the other one came up with it too much. And I think it's, that's why I'm going with disgust on that one. You guys got everything else. So you know, here. Scott, two things. One, he's talking out when he's gravelly, he's in the back of his mouth. He's talking with mm -hmm. authority. He's doing that. Blah, blah, blah. When he moves to the front of his mouth <clears throat> and he's emotional, meaning fear or that kind of thing. And he only talks with his lower jaw more like that. People do that when they're emotional. I'm dealing with a fair amount of that right now. And I realized that your tone drops and rounds when you're feeling deep emotion because your jaw doesn't move as much. It's a way a lot of people will contain very sad emotion rather than talking forward because it has a tendency to bring up more emotion and make them more bubbly. So they're containing. And I see it in him as well as talking away from the back of his mouth. And that usually I think is when somebody is fearful of how they're being perceived. Good call. Charlotte, I want you to know that I am truly and deeply sorry. I brought my personal experience into the workplace, and I shouldn't have done that. I was trying to help. Obviously, I didn't. I am even more sorry that I further complicated the situation. My goal was the exact opposite. I wish nothing but good for you and for all survivors of sexual assault. All right. There is another complaint I want to address from a woman in my office who said that I groped her in my home office. Let me be clear, that never happened. She wants anonymity, and I respect that. So I am limited by what I can say. But her lawyer has suggested that she will file a legal claim for damages. That will be decided in a court of law. Trial by newspaper or biased reviews are not the way to find the facts in this matter. I welcome the opportunity for a full and fair review before a judge and a jury because this just did not happen. Mark finally cusses. <laughs> all right uh mark what do you got yeah uh so just a little bit on this uh in this case i saw seven large looks for approval i saw many many kind of micro ones as well so clearly here's a moment here where the looks for approval have gone up substantially from the four that we saw right at the start i think there's a big uptick in looks for approval so i go here like okay so why is this bit so different why does he want even more approval from his audience on this one here's what i'm going to hazard a guess on this happened at home or what he calls was the home office. I think there's a big difference in his perception of how it looks to be seen to have done something indecent, you know, in the office as to in the home or in the home office where he's kind of reduced the severity of it. You know, this, this is a, a, a situation where he may, and, and as he says, the courts of law will decide this. So don't you think about this. Don't you think about this at all, because the courts of law will. What other courts might? I mean, why even say the courts of law? What is it, the tennis courts? You're going to play tennis about it or a bit of badminton? Like, we know you just say court. But what he has to do is stop you thinking about this, going, don't think about this, because courts of law are going to deal with it. So the law have got this. Don't you think about it. 
he's worried that this is this is going to break up his ma- if it's still there. I don't know whether the guy's married or not. I don't no, he's know. not. Yeah. Oh, well, you. okay. You're all right, mate. You you already have not been <laughs> too much of a success in that that department for yourself, anyway. So uh, so there you go. Uh, no no fear, no fear there. But anyway, don't think about this anymore. This will be decided in the courts of law, not the courts of tennis or badminton. <laughs> that other people decide stuff in. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with you, man. This when we see this one eyebrow hesitantly try to lift up on his face when we have a true emotion versus a fake emotion they come from very different parts of the brain the last time you were at a a concert and really enjoying yourself and smiling you weren't stopping to think oh wait i need to smile right now this is the time i need to smile so when we when we do a fake facial expression or fake gestures they're more likely to be asymmetrical because they haven't been tightening those muscles on the face for six million years they don't have a whole lot of practice so that's we're more likely to see some asymmetry there i think that's perhaps what this might be uh during the word woman there's a single shoulder shrug here i cannot tell if that's associated with a hand gesture or not the Uh, Head shaking is during his denial, which is in keeping with his normal baseline behavior. The increased speed during denial. There's an increase in his speed, which is indicative of deception. There's an immediate mouth closure, which is different than his other ones. This one, it snaps shut immediately after that. When he's talking about a judge and a jury, his eyes close on specific words, just like a baton gesture. And this is, I'm using, this is a coined by Desmond Morris, if you want to read more about that. But a baton gesture is when it goes along with the cadence of what's being said. And then, this just did not happen. There's more baton eye closures at all of those words. Then there's a non-contracted denial where there's a non-contracted statement. Instead of didn't, he said did not. Then there's no claim that the accusation was false. There is no claim that the accusation is false. That's a big deal. The high blink rate uh, in this video is almost a, a new baseline for him. But I cannot count that as deceptive, and I won't. Since he's been doing it throughout the entire video, I won't count this as, as standing out from the crowd However, with a score of 11 necessary for deception to be likely, his score here without the blink rate is a 26. Ooh, we have a winner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Scott. All here. right. Well, his blink, blink rate is uh, 59 times 46 seconds. And at the top of this, in that very first sentence, when he, when he starts talking, it's like somebody's turned on a robot and it's going through that protocol of making sure everything works, that eyebrows, it's just going nuts up there. It's, a, it's just such an odd deviation from what he's been doing. He just totally starts squiggling around, like Greg says, worm on a griddle. Uh, the squint, when he says, who... From a woman in my office who said I, that's when we see a tiny little squint. So that that suggests it denotes anger at that point. Squints can mean a lot of different things. In this point, at this point, when you see that squint where it is, and you can see the whites of his eyes really well as he squints, that denotes or indicates anger, in my opinion. At that point, it can go, it can go a lot of different ways there. Then from that shoulder squinch that that you're looking at there, Chase, when he says from a woman in my office, I think he's actually doing this forward, like. Uh, making himself a little bit smaller at that point. I could be wrong, too, because I can't tell what's happening. He may be doing something like, you know, bringing his hands together, but he's going down, as he says it, instead of when you would be coming forward and up a little bit. Could be wrong on that, but I don't know. Um, The eyebrow movement, um, they move up uh, more up and down here than any other place in this entire series of videos we're watching, Um, especially that one on the right side, like I was saying earlier. They go up and down 17 times in this clip. 17 times. That's a lot. That's a whole lot. When he says, and I respect that, that's when we see that micro expression. What would some will call a micro expression of contempt, but it's not. It's writ large. It's huge, (laughs) the contempt on his face at that point. Um, And then he looks away from his normal focal point to, again, I, I think you were saying, Chase, who or what we don't know. 
Um, but you can tell him, look away at that. So I think he's connected with somebody there because they'd been brought up and he's making sure they know he said it right. Maybe it was something they'd gone over several times. Um, so that, that kind of bugged me. Um, I, it's, there's so much stuff in here I can go on, but I'm not going to. Mark, what do you got? No, I'm done. It oh, wait. Greg. All right, let me try it again. Hang on. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, all the same things you're seeing. I'm going to cover a couple of them in redundancy, but that I just think we need to cover this. First of all, when you talk about the brow up, guys, we call that request for approval or something. We're looking to you to get approval, or we may use our brow to drive home points. Many gestures, many things that we do can have multiple meanings. A great example is the one that you brought up, Chase. He's blinking his eyes, but then he goes, boom, boom, boom. And he does a non-contracted denial. And he illustrates or drives home his point with each. Much like our little friend, Aaron Caffey, saying, kill my parents in that video. The same thing, using your eyes to punctuate, batoning with your eyes. And that's a great Desmond Morris man watching. Great book. You go find batoning gestures there. He starts off with lip compression right out of the gate. That's from the last question. He's illustrating with his right hand. You see that shoulder moving. He, in most cases where he's talking about something negative, he's illustrating with his right hand. Positives left. When he's doing his resume statements is here. When he's saying something negative, his hands move over to here. He's doing now a lot of that, what we talked about, front of mouth talking, and it's making him sound whiny. No more gravel, more whiny sounding. One brow goes up. His blink rate goes through the roof. Then he does that blink rate to illustrate and a non-contracted denial. One other thing, Mark, not only is it in a court of law, not only is it with a judge and jury, but they're going to review, not a trial, not a trial. He avoids that word wholesale. Nice. Guilty people don't like things like trials. Lots of red flags, guys. Like we said, we're Switzerland, but Switzerland, even Switzerland can see across the border. Here we are. That's all I got. Excellent. There is another complaint I want to address from a woman in my office who said that I groped her in my home office. Let me be clear, that never happened. She wants anonymity, and I respect that. So I am limited but what I can say. But her lawyer has suggested that she will file a legal claim for damages. That will be decided in a court of law. Trial by newspaper or biased reviews are not the way to find the facts in this matter. I welcome the opportunity for a full and fair review before a judge and a jury because this just did not happen. All right, let's move along. Other complainants raised against me questions that have sought to unfairly characterize and weaponize everyday interactions that I've had with any number of New Yorkers. The New York Times published a front page picture of me touching a woman's face at a wedding and then kissing her on the cheek. That is not front page news. I've been making the same gesture in public all my life. I actually learned it from my mother and from my father. It is meant to convey warmth, nothing more. Indeed, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of photos of me using the exact same gesture. I do it with everyone, black and white, young and old, straight and LGBTQ, powerful people, friends, strangers, people who I meet on the street. After the event, the woman told the press that she took offense at the gesture. And for that, I apologize. Jesus. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I think you should put that there. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. Okay, I'm going to go first on uh, this. One. I'm going to keep it really short because I can't wait to hear what Mark has to say about these pictures. <laughs> All right. Uh, there at the top where he says, where he opens up with other complainants, I think he thought he was supposed to say other complaints because he stops and he takes that that really weird, catches himself, yeah. breathes in really quickly, and then starts over again. I think he second-guessed the wording there. Um, and that's why it sounds so odd. Mark, what do you got? Well, so 
I would suggest that, um, look, his mum and dad have done him a disservice here. I can totally understand what, hang on, that is my, that, can you hear that? Yeah. Yeah, what is it? All right. It's the Vitamix. <laughs> let me just, what's, let me, what's Vitamix? It's like a really powerful blender. Oh, okay. oh, yeah, I can hear it. I wondered what it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like That's a okay. Why does it sing? Going. Why does it sing, Mark? Because it's making such beautiful food. That's. Oh, Mark, what's happening? Oh, no, go ahead. Keep going. No, go ahead. It's cool. no biggie. No, no, no. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to get it switched off. Hang on. Hang cool. On. Look at him walking away in those shorts. <laughs> Here, let me do it. Oh, my God. I'm going to get some coffee up. Pesto is being made. Mark, we're all peeing. All right, I'll do the same then. All right, Mark, finish up. Right, okay, where was I? Uh, okay, touching people's face. He says, I touch people's faces all the time. He shows images of, you know, his parents uh, doing that. Uh, like for me, you know, my wife gets to touch my face, my kids would, my mum, you know, other really close family members, you know, even if my mum touched my face for long enough, I would go, come on, mum, stop that. You know, it's, 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 it's a very intimate gesture, or it can be used as a submissive gesture to see whether somebody will submit to the intimacy of you touching their face. This is clear from from these images that we see is is he's made sure, for example, he's saying there are thousands of images. Well, that's because that's how you want to be seen. You want to be seen as the strong, powerful leader and you want as many images out there possible of you holding the most delicate part of of somebody and yes of course some of them will be smiling because it's a smile of submission it's a smile of please don't hurt me you've already got me in a potential death grip so look putting it on your mum and dad and saying hey my mum and dad did it to me well if they said hey son go round and touch people's faces as much as you can they did you a disservice what they should have been saying is see look look that lovely little doggy there. What's your dog called again? Hattie. Hattie. Um, see, Hattie gets to touch Greg's face. If I went up to Greg and started licking his face like Hattie, like that wouldn't be acceptable. Yeah, that's just, but his dog gets to do it. Like, why don't I get to do it? Listen, just because a piece of behavior happens in one situation doesn't mean it happens in every situation. Just because your mum and dad held your face doesn't mean you can do that with everybody. And anyway, he knows as much as I know that he's not doing it as a signal of love and caring. We can see from the images that he uses it, uses it in PR as a signal of I'm powerful and I can take control of things that shouldn't be mine. It's what we call territorial aggression. These are images of territorial aggression, I would say. It's a power issue, not one of love or respect. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Should I, should I change my name to to Scott or when I go in and edit? You called me Greg. <laughs> I told you Greg. You did. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> All right. Let's oh, pass it back th over. We'll, today? It'll be a good yeah, day. Yeah, a long day. Uh, where did I go? Chase? Yeah. Yeah. Chase, what do you got? I was uh, spanked growing up. And I learned very quickly before that that's not appropriate in the workspace. Like <laughs> my mom and dad did that with me uh, and it's not okay to do it. And depends on your you, job, but yeah. <laughs> if you think about legitimizing behaviors, what else do you hear people say, my parents did it to me and I'm doing it to someone else. I just, I'm just gonna leave that there on the table here for you. 
Uh, but Mark, uh, just a quick question. For just the members of the behavior panel, would we be able to touch your face when we meet up? I, I, would, I would let you. <laughs> okay. No, I promise not to right. lick your face. But <laughs> <laughs> because now we've had this conversation, I would know I'm why. Going in. Yeah, I wouldn't know in. why. I'd go, yeah, because I remember because Chase said, hey. I'm going be, in. I'm going in for the kiss too, Mark. Could I'm we do this? Kiss. <laughs> I let you once and I'd see how I liked it. And then based on that, <laughs> I might, you know, say, hey, Chase, you could do that some more. Yeah. Scott, let's turn down the volume a little bit on that uh, grip. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You got it. So uh, when, he, when he says complainant, I, I totally agree that was a mistake. Okay. And that was my first reaction. There's a teleprompter. Uh, but there's also a dismissive shrug about complainant. And again, this is cue cards or teleprompter. I'm not sure what it is. If you ever do use a teleprompter with Zoom or anything like that, adjust your margins and squeeze them in. That way you're not doing a whole lot of lateral movement. Just a quick uh, tip. Mark is the Zoom expert, though. But when he uses the word weaponize, all media weaponize everything, period. And so do, guess what, politicians. That's that's the entire job of politicians. And we think this video is political. Guess what? All politicians are liars. But at the at the mention of The New York Times, there's a confused uh, facial expression that comes across his face. And you can see it clear as day and you will when the video comes back up. But there is a technique in charisma that is using a statement to bring background and upbringing into anything, anything. Uh, and in this, like somebody says, oh, where are you from? Well, I've, I've lived in many places. You know, my mom was doing this. And my dad was in the military. And that, that's, a, that's a great conversational technique because most people will respond, I'm from New York. I'm from Chicago instead of giving a story to it to give people threads that they can grab onto. And that's exactly what he's doing here. I don't think this is a rehearsed technique though, but there is a, a statement here that I'd like to put out there because there is some manipulation going on. A history of a certain behavior does not make it rational, acceptable, or welcome. So this argument is meant to establish a baseline and to make it normal in your mind. I do think it is a brilliantly thought out message to, to put this compilation together to make it seem normal to most people. But here's the biggest deviation from all of his baseline, and that is the degree of apology. How much he is acting in an apologetic manner here in this entire series is the largest deviation from his baseline I have ever seen. And I spent some time this morning going through a lot. This is also sometimes called an apology or a mini confession. And this most of the time stems from actual guilt or a desire to communicate that a mistake was made. You know, we have a natural need to confess. We have a natural need to feel apologetic and, and regretful. His normal behavior would have not apologized at all. I think it would be more likely to take the situation head on with very firm denial. So this is the most apologetic, which means this entire thing is a deviation from his baseline. Greg. <clears throat> yeah, I'll keep this pretty simple. Number one, we started this by talking about people defer to authority. What's more powerful than the governor of New York or a Kennedy or someone else? He, of course, he can walk up and put his hands on your face because he is somebody. If random guy number two walks up and grabs you by the head, you'd probably punch him or swing to get out of there. But because he's somebody and he's authority, there's also this whole charisma piece. Once a person has established their value, then they get to do other things. We wouldn't tolerate that off anybody. <clears throat> the problem with that is that pattern can also carry over into other than in public things when there's authority and a person takes what they want. That's why 
he really should be careful how he approaches this specific action. Mark, to your point, we don't go up and grab anyone's face. But if you're somebody rich and famous, you get away with it in a way that somebody, random guy, homeless guy comes up to you with a bag of stuff and grabs your face, you probably are going to shoot him, pull out, run away, do something. So there's the problem here. The other piece is, I will say this, I do think he recognizes the ship has sailed and he was not on it. And the world doesn't tolerate that kind of stuff because you see his brow go up when he goes, look, I, I get it. I, I now understand that. Somebody's told him, hey, yeah, that might have been okay in 1960 or 1980 even. The 80s were a very different place, but not today. The world has changed and you have to change with it. I think I do see recognition of that in him. I'll leave it at that. I'll just say we started this by Chase talking about the white coat syndrome and about Milgram. And this guy's in a position of authority. And if there's one thing you learn from your military career, you know, people can say all the bad things they want to say about the military. Many, many, many years ago, it's when you're in a position of authority, you have a whole lot more responsibility to be cautious about what you do to other people or cause other people to feel or that kind of thing. Being one of the young women actually says he was not just the most powerful person I knew. He was the most powerful person in the state of New York. Imagine the power with that. So, yeah, you get to kiss people and touch them on the face. Should you? Probably not. I'll leave it at that. Other complainants raised against me questions that have sought to unfairly characterize and weaponize everyday interactions that I've had with any number of New Yorkers. The New York Times published a front page picture of me touching a woman's face at a wedding and then kissing her on the cheek. That is not front page news. I've been making the same gesture in public all my life. I actually learned it from my mother and from my father. It is meant to convey warmth, nothing more. Indeed, there are hundreds, if not thousands of photos of me using the exact same gesture. I do it with everyone, black and white, young and old, straight and LGBTQ, powerful people, friends, strangers, people who I meet on the street. After the event, the woman told the press that she took offense at the gesture. And for that, I apologize. Cool. All right, we good? Yeah. We're good. Another woman stated that I kissed her on the forehead at our Christmas party and that I said, ciao, Bella. Now, I don't remember doing it, but I'm sure that I did. I do kiss people on the forehead. I do kiss people on the cheek. I do kiss people on the hand. I do embrace people. I do hug people, men and women. I do on occasion say, ciao, Bella. On occasion, I do slip and say sweetheart or darling or honey. I do banter with people. I do tell jokes, some better than others. I am the same person in public as I am in private. You have seen me do it on TV through all my briefings and for 40 years before that. I try to put people at ease. I try to make them smile. I try to connect with them. And I try to show my appreciation and my friendship. I now understand that there are generational or cultural perspectives that frankly, I hadn't fully appreciated. And I have learned from this. Uh, Chase, what do you got? There's a there's a head toss here, and I want you just to watch where it happens. I'm not going to tell you where it happens. I want you to watch, and I think it's dismissive. And if it's not dismissive, it's Greg's favorite phrase I think Greg has ever coined in body language when he says it's taffy pulling. And it's kind of like drawing someone's attention towards yourself. 
So we've established when he makes a denial in all of his behavior from the last 10 years of video that I looked at today, there's a head shake, but there's a head nod here in, in this video somewhere. And there's a head shake when he's sa when saying, no, I'm the same person in public as I am in private. And he shakes his head. No, but he, then he's nodding his head. Yes, I now understand. So when I was a, in first grade, my teacher's name was Mrs. Moses, and I bit the kid's arm next to me in class. His name was Ian. I got sent to the principal's office, and I bit him hard, like he was bleeding. And I had to write an apology letter. And this, my apology letter basically said, I'm sorry that I touched Ian for hitting me and I learned a lot not to disrupt the class. <laughs> and nice that, done. that's the same thing that we're seeing right here. It's the same thing. I'm sorry that I did this thing that's not at all what someone's accusing me of. I learned a lesson that's not at all what someone's accusing me of. And, and I didn't do anything to disrupt anything else except for what I'm exactly saying here in this, in this letter. That's all I got. Scott? As he begins, his eyebrows go up before he speaks. Now, you're going to see that when you're speaking with someone and your your idea comes to your mind or what you're going to say next or you want to interrupt and you go, because you know what you're going to say next. You're loaded with it. You are you're, you're you got it in the chamber and you're getting ready to go. And that's what's happening here. He's up. He knows what he's going to say, but it's trying to make this look natural. And it doesn't work at all. So that's an important thing. And we see that a couple of times here, but this is the biggest time we, we, we've seen it. Um and the part where he says, I don't remember doing it, but I'm sure I did. That's something you're going to hear in court all the time when you, when you deal with malpractice cases. You have doctors who get, get sued for somebody getting an infection. And they say, oh, it's because the doctor didn't wash his hands or it wasn't very clean during surgery. And that's what this came from. And that's why this developed. And that's why they passed away or they had to cut their arm off where the situation is. And so what they say is they don't say, you can't go and say, I remember I washed my hands this time before I did this surgery because I, I remember I dropped my ring. You can't do that because nobody's going to believe it, number two. And number one, there's no way to remember that since you do so many surgeries just like that one every day. So he's been set up to say that, to, to say, I'm sure I said it. I don't remember it, but I'm sure I said it. That's what that's about. So he's been prepped on that part of it. Um, having said all that, this whole thing is just full of, it just seems like the same old, same old as we're going through. Ch uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, Chase, he, I agree with you. He's trading guilt. If I can be guilty of one thing, it was not bad. I would kiss everybody I knew. I'd run up to them and I would do this. This is the same as the head holding thing I was talking about last time. He does do the brow up. Here's where he does the brow up. Hey, I've come to realize that. Okay, I, I did something wrong. This is what I did wrong. The other stuff he's not even talking about. I agree with you there. A hundred percent. His eyes are very wide at the end as he's as he's bringing that up. So here's where I think he needs one of all of our courses. Watch, go back and look at the pictures of who he's kissing. Some of those people are all into it, but the woman when he's kissing her hand, look at that body language. He needs a feedback loop. Like, hey, get get off me. You can see it. She doesn't do it. Al Sharpton doesn't look really impressed with being kissed on the cheek. Look at those and say, if I were approaching somebody, you know, like I was going to kiss them and they responded that way, how would I respond? Most of us have a good meter to say, hey, that's a off limits. Don't do that. You see it's not here with him. And so he's saying, I'm guilty of this. Here we go. So let's see what's next. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So uh, formerly this guy's spin doctor was Chris Como, his brother. The writing here, I think, has shifted slightly very interesting writing i think he's changed his spin doctor to doctor zeus at this point because it's become incredibly poetic and repetitive in the style of a child's storybook i've just praised it here i do kiss people on the cheek i do hug people when we meet i do touch faces black and white i wrote this verse to sound contrite <laughs> and that's exactly what, I mean, I think, you know, maybe it is still Chris who's writing this. Maybe they did, you know, get in the spirit of Dr. Zeus, but it's gone bizarre now. You know, that repetitive uh, storybook rhythm to it is just now totally over the top. So uh, at this point, I do not like him, Sam I am. 
I do not like him green eggs and ham at all. At I don't all. like him Greg I am. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where that, <laughs> where the dyslexia really hit in at that point. I called for when I first met Greg, I called him Linda for almost two weeks until yeah, I finally yeah, said but that's, it's, it's, that would be an Greg. easy mistake to I make. I still use that name occasionally. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Do you dress differently? No. Still dress the same. <laughs> no, that's still not going to work. Oh, guys, Scott's frozen. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Not better. It's not better than usual. Yeah, it was better than usual. <laughs> Another woman stated that I kissed her on the forehead at our Christmas party and that I said, ciao, Bella. Now, I don't remember doing it, but I'm sure that I did. I do kiss people on the forehead. I do kiss people on the cheek. I do kiss people on the hand. I do embrace people. I do hug people, men and women. I do on occasion say, ciao, Bella. On occasion, I do slip and say, sweetheart, or darling, or honey. I do banter with people. I do tell jokes, some better than others. I am the same person in public as I am in private. You have seen me do it on TV through all my briefings and for 40 years before that. I try to put people at ease. I try to make them smile. I try to connect with them. And I try to show my appreciation and my friendship. I now understand that there are generational or cultural perspectives that frankly I hadn't fully appreciated. And I have learned from this. Here we go. Other complaints relate to the work environment. Now, I have always said my office is a demanding place to work and that it is not for everyone. We work really, really hard. My office is no typical nine to five government office. And I don't want it to be. The stakes we deal with are very high, sometimes even life and death. We have to get the job done. I promised you that I would, and I will. But now, a number of complaints target female managers, which smacks to me of a double standard. First, when have you ever seen male managers maligned and villainized for working long hours or holding people accountable or for being tough. A strong male manager is respected and rewarded, but a strong female manager is ridiculed and stereotyped. It is a double standard. It is sexist and it must be challenged. Also, Remember where we are. Today, we are living in a superheated, if not toxic, political environment. That shouldn't be lost on anyone. Politics and bias are interwoven throughout every aspect of this situation. One would be naive to think otherwise. And New Yorkers are not naive. <laughs> what is he talking people. about? Where's, where, where's he going with that? Oh, one? I want to go first on this I one. I love it. <laughs> All right, Greg, go ahead. What do you got? Oh, I love I love this. Now he's doing something he knows how to do. He's a politician. He can talk without meaning, and he's doing a hell of a lot of it. He's chaffing and redirecting, but it's on a grand scale. He's filibustering is what he's doing. He's just spewing words and hoping one of them is good enough that you'll pick it up and run with it. But then he takes holy ground. He he took he takes the Bill Clinton playbook. I got work to do for the American people. And even then goes and says, well, if you were naive, you would believe this. But of course you're not naive. Don't be foolish. You're not naive. You don't believe any of this. This is one of the best garbage out of your mouth things I've ever heard. This is two minutes of absolute nothing. 
And when he didn't spend two minutes talking about the crime, he spent a lot of time talking about his experience with his family member and then why he was better than that. Two minutes talking about God knows what this is. You could, this is AI. AI could create this on your cell phone just by punching in data and letting it finish the sentence. This is absolute nonsense. Is chaff and redirect, and it's an opportunity to get away from what he's covered before. He does cover a handful of other things, of course, righteous causes, and his body language is right because he's a politician. He gets righteous indignation. The chin comes up. He throws out that throat, and then when things are really horrible, he covers his throat again. It's, the body language is there because he's politicking. That's what he does. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I, I agree. It's it's chaff and redirect writ large. It has nothing to do with anything we're talking about. He's just trying to. I uh, just it's. I, I'm I'm not going to address. Any Let's of define that chaff and ridiculous. redirect because I forgot to do it. Chaff and redirect okay. I, comes from. I came up with that because when you see a plane, it drops all these flares and stuff so that missiles go after the wrong thing. All that you're doing is puking words and information, hoping you'll grab one of those and track after the wrong one. Scott, sorry. Yeah, okay, no, I'm cool. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, um, so look, he starts, I couldn't agree more. So he starts off with this resume statement, uh, you know, I work really, really hard. So it's like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Well, sorry, we'll just go <laughs> away then. Sorry, we didn't realize that. We didn't realize you weren't really. And also, when you stress that enough, like something comes up in my head going, yeah, but I bet you don't. And maybe he does. But when you stress it that hard, it pushes us to the other side. Like your, your, your spin doctor should be way better than, than this. Um, then he goes, oh, then he lays down life and death. Like we deal with life and death. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you doing surgery? You're doing surgery right now. <laughs> sorry. Well, we'll be quiet and we'll leave then. I didn't realize you were operating on a body right now okay i'm so, again like pulls out high status high status events so we'll walk away and not not get involved then he goes for a logical the logic ar argument of what is or the false logic argument of what is good for the goose is good for the gander it's i like, well that's not true for a start that's just bad logic and also <laughs> just as greg saying like what are you talking about where are you right now in your argument? Where have we gone? I, I can see, you know, what you're talking about may have its place. Other, well, definitely has its place other places. But I don't see how you got here. And I don't know how, what it has to do with these, you know, 11 people or so have ac accused you of X. It, it's, it's a non, it's non sequitur, essentially. It's, you're exactly right. It's chaff and redirect. Um, uh, it's the idea of if you well if you have if you have a quality in one place then you must have a quality e everywhere. What he's doing is he's trying to use the argument uh, that's against him against the people who are arguing, but he's having to do it with non sequiturs. It doesn't make any sense, and also it's just inaccurate. Just because you have a quality somewhere doesn't ever mean you 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 should or have to have a quality everywhere. It's more complex than that. And if you think it's not more complex than that, then you are the naive one, not potentially uh, the, the New York public who weren't naive. I think they saw you and your brother coming, saw you at a long distance because it was badly signaled what you were doing there. And, and this power play at the end, this manipulation at the end, not good. Really, really, uh, really, really bad one. Chase, what do, you, what do you got on this one? The first time I ever saw this argument uh, structure was in a trial uh, manual. This is probably 2001. And it was written by a guy named Jerry Spence, who is actually brilliant. Uh, the title of the book is How to Argue and Win Every Time. <laughs> and this, is, this strategy is kind of how you pitched a jury in the early 90s. And it's, here's a fact, only an idiot would ignore that fact, and you are not an idiot. And that's, that's kind of the structure here. But pay attention to other political things that are going on here, targeting the female managers. They're targeting, not aimed at, not accusing, they're targeting, specifically targeting female managers. This is, his word use is just helping you to see his frame and only his frame that he wants you to look through. Uh, and there's more framing here. This is a hard place to work. It's not a nine to five office and you don't want that, right? 
you want me to be different. You want me to, to work really hard. So we're, he's getting what's called an agreement chain in place right here. And when, when have you seen male managers working hard, holding people accountable or being tough? I think that's what he said. He wants you to think that I want, he wants you to think that's exactly what the complaints are. He wants you to think that's what the complaints say. I guarantee you that's not what the complaints say. There's some pretty good psychology uh, here, but no one has that standard. Nobody. Literally, you can, you can go to any Fortune 500 company. No one has that standard. And, but he wants you to think so, so that his problem of his problem can ride along the back of sex and gender issues like a remora fish that hangs around sharks. There's nothing to see here, but I'm protected by this big thing. That's all I'll say. Other complaints relate to the work environment. Now, I have always said my office is a demanding place to work and that it is not for everyone. We work really, really hard. My office is no typical nine to five government office, and I don't want it to be. The stakes we deal with are very high, sometimes even life and death. We have to get the job done. I promised you that I would, and I will. But now, a number of complaints target female managers which smacks to me of a double standard. First, when have you ever seen male managers maligned and villainized for working long hours or holding people accountable or for being tough? A strong male manager is respected and rewarded, but a strong female manager is ridiculed and stereotyped. It is a double standard. It is sexist, and it must be challenged. Also, remember where we are. Today, we are living in a superheated, if not toxic, political environment. That shouldn't be lost on anyone. Politics and bias are interwoven throughout every aspect of this situation. One would be naive to think otherwise. And New Yorkers are not naive. All right, well, now let's roll it around the room and uh, see what everybody thinks, kind of wrap up 30 seconds or less about what we think is going on. Mark, you want to start, then Chase, then Greg, then I'll wrap it up. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um yeah, I, 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 some, I think the whole thing is really old school, uh, and I think we've we've got that idea across that back in the eighties when he started out, what he was doing would have been okay and best in class, not necessarily acceptable by any means, but seen as all right from from his uh, by by some and many, right from his his actions to his strategies around how to account for his actions now is a very different world uh, you know many would say it's a it's a protopia it's a better world uh it's maybe not a utopia it's not perfect but it, it's getting better and i don't think he's quite caught up as he says himself with with what the better standards are now not only of how you you know, use your behavior, but also how you can better account for your behavior when it has gone um, gone awry. But even then, you know, down to this idea of touching people's faces, there, there are not any cultures on the planet where it is acceptable for just anybody to go up and touch anybody's face and for that to be universally liked by everybody just doesn't exist. That's a, that's a, 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 a power play. Uh, Chase, what's your summary of this one? A lot of deception, a lot of politicking, and it's deception that's wrapped in a little uh, tissue paper wrapper of truth so that it feels right. It can, there's some kind of a ring of truth to it. And I think it's a lot like what uh, 
I think it was Greg, you were talking about this, and AI could predict this. And uh, I'll, I'll prove it to you. Go in the comments right now and hit the comment and just hit that auto predictor button on the top of your keyboard and take a look. It'll come up with some kind of cohesive sentence that sounds like it should be right, but it's not really saying anything at all. Uh, Greg? Yeah, <clears throat> if I walk through this entire thing and forget everything except video four, go back and watch video four and listen for the cadence shift around asking questions about meaningful, supportive, romantic, what, whatever kind of crap relationship he said in there. You, you don't talk to people who have had sexual abuse about their supportive, romantic, it's just an awkward sentence. Forget the structure of the sentence, what he's actually talking about. Listen to the change. Watch the entire video. Go back. Watch video four and watch that sentence structure. That's enough to make me go red flag, red flag, red flag. Does it mean he did this? No, we're not, we're not saying that. I want you to watch, pay attention to everything here. And then all of the stuff, I do think he's old school. His parents taught him to grab people's face and kiss it. So what? If my parents taught me that, I'd be in jail now because I'm not famous and rich and can't walk up and grab people. You, you would be known as the, like, you would have some kind of a serial violator thing going on. So yeah, this thing, go back, watch video four, and then make up your mind. That's all I got. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll wrap it up with, I think it's, it's, it's just pitiful that from the beginning to the end, it's, it's, you'd expect to see this. This is everything you'd expect to see. And so he thought that's what you should see. Then connects with his brother, like Mark was talking about, and they come up with this, this tale of, and, and a lot of things like we were talking about in, in, in when we were watching the videos, a lot of these things uh, jump out to me. Uh, the way predators approach these situations, they say, I talked to her about her problem, about, about the problem she had before, because I've had that problem too in my family, and I want to talk to her about it. Those kind of things send up red flags right and left. When somebody starts talking about that, when you're talking to them about something they shouldn't have done, and they start that stuff, well, what you, what, how, did you, how did this start? You, know, you start way off, and you get them talking about it, they'll start doing that. And that's how we got into the conversation, because how else could that conversation come up? And why would this girl feel that way? But this is ju this is just a a pitiful attempt to 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 for someone to clear their name and explain what they've done and why. So that's what I got. All right. Well, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe. Just hit that little red button down there. It says subscribe, and you'll become a panelist just like us. And if that's it, we're that's good. It. All right. Thanks. It. All right, fellas. That was a good, and I'll see you next time. Eu não sei se é louco.